lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. to Bethlehem Lutheran Church. Wherever you find yourself this day and whenever you are joining us, as a community, we are called to walk with each other so that we might know and experience the goodness and grace of God. And in this time of social distancing, we will continue to adapt our services to an online format so that you may remember that you are loved as you are for who you are, we join our hearts in prayer. Lord God, you are the good shepherd who leads us down the many paths we travel in life. As we gather this day, keep us mindful of the paths that our neighbors walk, both near and far, that we might reach out and be a blessing to others with the same grace, compassion, and mercy that you've shown us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Linda Hendrickson, and I'm here to read the scripture lessons for Sunday, May 3rd. The first reading is from Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 through 47 in the New Testament. Today's reading is a description of life in the community following Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out on God's people. The new community is sustained in worship and fellowship shares what they have, and ensures that everyone has enough. The reading begins at verse 42. The baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. 
Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the second reading is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Families with children, now is the time, if they are not worshiping with you, to call them in to wherever you are at for another Matt and Chad's adventure as we introduce the gospel reading today. Today we have a treat for you because we actually found a really old VHS tape of a training video that was produced here at Bethlehem. We hope you enjoy. see you there. Congratulations on becoming a new employee and or member at Bethlehem Lutheran Church. It's really important that we follow in the way of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. And so we have created this training video using the marvels of 1988 technology. We have put together this training video to help you understand the difference between a Good Shepherd and a Bad Shepherd. Enjoy this training video. Scenario one. Man gets hurt. Good shepherd example. Ow, I saw it, it hurts. So. Oh, uh, Matt, yeah. are you okay? No, I saw it and it hurts. Oh no. Don't worry. Ouch. I will help you. One moment. Okay. I'll wait here. Because it hurts. Real bad. Matt, here is an aspirin oh. and a band-aid for you. Thank you. You are welcome. Is there somebody that I should call? Call my mom. I will do that right now. Okay. Shepherd. Bad shepherd example. Ah! Oh, it hurt my knees. Oh, my knees. There goes the knee. What's wrong with you? Oh, I think it hurt my knee. Oh, you're just being a baby. Rub some dirt on it. I think it dislocated. Fine, fine. Definitely. I'll get you a band aid. One second. Definitely. Here, will a band aid make you feel better, Matt? Oh. Have some band aids. Oh. Have some band. Have 
Have some band-aids, Matt. Have some band-aids. Oh, no. <laughs> Makes me feel bad inside, too. Bad Shepherd. Scenario two, Chad's lunch. Bad Shepherd example. Oh boy, I sure am hungry. Forgot to bring the lunch too. Man, I wonder what's in here. Ooh. Chad's lunch. He usually brings some good stuff. <laughs> yeah, let's get this guy here. <laughs> He usually has some good stuff. Ooh, a sandwich and chips. Yeah. I chose well. Ooh, boy. I am hungry today. I have worked very hard. Looking forward to my lunch. What? Jiminy Jellickers. My lunch has been stolen. That makes me feel bad. Bad Shepherd. Good Shepherd example. I sure am hungry. It's been a hard day at work. Hmm, what's for lunch? Hmm. Chad's lunch. I probably shouldn't eat Chad's lunch. He works real hard for his food. I will leave it there. something else to eat. I'm very hungry today. I packed myself a lovely lunch. Oh, I'm so excited to have lunch today. Ooh, I remember I got a cookie in here. Excellent. Good Shepherd. Scenario three, wild animal, bad shepherd example. Boy, Matt, it sure is a good day to be an employee or member at Bethlehem Lutheran Church. A lovely day for a walk inside the church. It is. I hope we don't see any wild animals. I hope so too. <gasps> Look at that. Shepherd. Good shepherd example. Boy, Matt, it sure is a good day to be an employee or member at Bethlehem Lutheran Church. A lovely day for a walk inside the church. It is. I hope we don't see any wild animals. I hope so too. <sighs> Look at that! <laughs> oh my, it's a wild animal! Hold on one second, Matt. Okay. What am I gonna do? I will protect you. You run. I will fight it. Good shepherd. Oh. Well, I hope you enjoyed this training video. Now you are prepared to be a good shepherd in our church and in our community. Thanks for joining us today. Gospel according to the 10th chapter of John. Jesus says, 
Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in another way, is a thief or a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is a shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. The poetry of David in Psalm 23 and the words of Jesus in John 10 invite us to picture God as a good shepherd, which, of course, means we are the sheep, which can be a bit insulting. Sheep are rather stupid. They're almost always defenseless and vulnerable. They get lost, they go astray, they like to stay together and will run away at the first scent of hope, and they follow easily. And, of course, it's an analogy, but aren't we humans far and away the smartest of all creatures? And in the animal world, aren't we the most dangerous predators and the ones on the top of the food chain? Of course, all that's true. But David grew up taking care of sheep. He also was an astute observer of humankind. So what did he see in this experience that connects with people all through the ages? How is it that God is like a shepherd and we the sheep? Well, like sheep, we humans need the right conditions in which to thrive. For we are vulnerable if suddenly placed in the wild like the reality TV show, Naked and Afraid. You see, like all creatures, we need water, nutrition, clothing, shelter, safety. But if we look more closely, sheep are vulnerable. So are we. They get lost. Sheep easily follow and have a herd mentality Sheep easily sense danger, so they get afraid. And predators do stalk them. So taking the right path is really about thriving or struggling. It's about living or dying. Following a good shepherd has everything to do with what life holds for the sheep. And so with this in mind, let's focus today on how David inspired by the Spirit, communicates his hard-earned faith so simply in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. That's both a statement of trust and choice. Who are you going to trust? Who or what will you follow in life? It matters. Robert Fall, Frost called it the road less traveled. And as he says at the end of his poem, and that has made all the difference. So if we don't choose, then we default to going with a herd or maybe just going off on our own and stray. Why the Lord, though? Because he makes me lie down in green pastures in rocky, sometimes uh, arid Israel. Green pastures aren't everywhere and sheep have to be moved or they'll overgraze. Nomadic shepherds in Israel, even to this day, know the right paths 
and where they lead, and they matter. Like beside still waters. Did you know that sheep get dizzy by flowing water and they'll fall in? They need still in order to drink. He restores my soul. Restoring the soul for humans, of course, means deeper needs than just survival. He leads me down the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Righteousness in the Bible means to be living according to God's purposes for us in creation, to be in harmony with. Paths of righteousness in God's creation are seen to lead us to good. So in this first part of the poem, David describes life's most basic needs for thriving and how God, our creator, wants to provide what we need. That's reassuring. And these needs aren't going away. But now we come to a shift in his poem. And it's an important one. Because we realize sooner or later that life is never smooth and gentle all the time. Except maybe in the commercials, if you buy the right products, or in fairy tales when they lived happily ever after, but not in real life. No one escapes the things that can make us afraid. So David goes on. Because he knows only too well the difficult stuff. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Woody Allen suggests not walking through the valley of shadow of death, but running through the valley of shadow of death, and I suppose we'd all wish we could do that. But shepherding in Israel requires moving sheep, sometimes from higher ground to lower and vice versa, and in that rocky, mountainous terrain, that means that some of the passages to go higher or lower are going to be narrow, rocky, and shadowy. They're passages. If you were a predator interested in some lamb chops, where do you think you'd want to hide? Wouldn't it be in a shadowy close in place where you could just suddenly pounce and get where you need to go. Those dark places, those places of passage, they have to go through them. Predators know that. And sheep sense it. You see, sometimes we undersell sheep. They're not entirely stupid. They're actually quite sensitive to danger and sound. They've got great hearing in their eyes, which are, are um, slits, long slits, actually can see 310 degrees. We can see 180. Their peripheral vision is great. Shadow of death, which is translated, actually literally means valley of shadows. So David knows when he goes through the valley of shadows the sheep get nervous. But notice what David says, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. A sturdy staff in the hands of an experienced shepherd protects. And let's pause at the words, thou art with me, or you are with me. See, in danger, the false shepherds disappear when threatened. They're just looking out for themselves. And the inexperienced ones don't have much power to handle the situation. What does it mean when we say that the Lord God is with us in the dark valleys of life? One answer comes through deeper wisdom the kind of wisdom we often don't see when we're young because in certain ways we don't think it will happen to us until it does. But here's the wisdom. Often it is through life's most difficult times that God gives God's greatest gifts to us. Often we see them in retrospect. It might be something that formed our character 
or our capacity to reach out to others, our wisdom. But it means what David says. You are with me. David went through a lot of tough times, and we see that in many of Psalms that he writes. Tough times. And he found that God was there. We might paraphrase that famous line of Robert Schuller, which he uh, coined in the farm crisis, where he said, uh, tough times don't last forever, tough people do. And there's some truth to that. I'd paraphrase it in the psalm as, tough times don't last forever, God does. And God is with us. Of course, nowhere did this come out so powerfully, so mysteriously, so remarkably than when Jesus entrusted his fate to God by walking in the darkest valley of all for our sake, literally the depths of hell on the cross. And he even felt at his lowest point that God had forsaken him. But if you look at the way in which the New Testament describes the resurrection, it's never that Jesus rose on Jesus' own power. It's rather he was raised. Who was he raised by? God, his heavenly Father. So now the picture shifts from the dark valley to actually being at a table. And God is the host and the enemies cannot enter. Listen, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Here's what this means, because it's an odd image. In the Middle East, there's a very sacred duty of hospitality when somebody comes and you are being hospitable to them. The duty to a guest is so sacred that in that society, enemies, if they were really intent on doing uh, injury to the guest, would not dare to come into the tent of the host. And so you have this picture of God preparing a table for you and me that is bountiful in the presence of enemies who can only glare from the outside. If any of you saw the movie Lone Survivor about the one Navy SEAL that survives, he finally was saved because uh, a person um, from that area came across him and brought him into his home to, to bathe his wounds. When the Taliban found out he was in there, they wanted to come in and kill him, but the man was duty-bound to protect him because he was in his care. And this is the image that uh, Paul, that uh, David uses when he is describing us in the presence of God. It's like we're in the tent. And Martin Luther, I think, put it very, very well when he said, what are the three great enemies that we can never destroy except God can? And that is the power of sin, the power of death, and the power of evil. So David concludes, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Back in seminary, uh, when you're young and you have to go into a hospital room with an elder, and somehow you're in the role of a pastor, it, it's a little intimidating. And I would get nervous because I thought it would be difficult to sit with somebody who maybe was going into surgery and fearing bad news. And one day that actually happened to one of Norma and my friends, um, a fellow teacher. Uh, she was going in with a, a real genuine fear that there was something very, very seriously wrong with her in terms of cancer. 
And uh, I visited her in the hospital uh, uh, because it was the hospital that I was training at. And uh, I remember looking at her as somebody that was sophisticated, uh, competent, uh, older than I was. I wondered if my f prayer would just seem kind of stupid. I really felt exposed. I did have a prayer with her. I left. Later on, I came back. Turned out that the surgery went just wonderfully. She was happy. I asked her about when, just before she went in, and she said, well, my husband uh, joined me, and we had prayer, and we read scripture. And I was curious. I'm just curious. What scripture did you read? And she said, um, Psalm 23. And I said, hmm, that's surprising to me in a way because it's so common, as if I was thinking that they would find some real sophisticated passage of scripture that I would keep away in my mind. And then she said something very interesting. She said, when I'm afraid, I want to hear what's familiar, what goes deep into my mind and soul. And Psalm 23 comforted me the most. And it was an aha moment for me. Of course I thought. When facing darkness, the things that may define us to people and society, like money or success or social standing or sophistication or fame, they just kind of all drop away, don't they? What matters is whether someone's there and if they care and if there's love and if there's hope. In some ways, we are like sheep living creatures in a good but vast and sometimes dangerous universe that's pretty overwhelming sometimes. And it matters to us at the most basic level that we're loved, we're protected, we're never left alone, and we live in hope. And that comes through the Good Shepherd. Amen.
we join our hearts in prayer as we pray for the world, for the church, and for all people who have needs. Almighty God, send your guiding spirit to unite your church on earth, to heal its wounds and to mend its brokenness, so that it may clearly reflect the kingdom of God, welcoming all in Christ's name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, as followers of Christ, open our eyes to see the needs of the world and move us as your servants to do your will. In lands where people die of hunger, help us to give food. In lands where the helpless are oppressed, give us the courage to speak out. In lands that are ravaged by war, help us to work for peace. And in lands where intolerance is the norm, allow us to see others as your children. In this time of pandemic, help us to look to those who are suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, give healing to all those who are sick, either in body, mind, or spirit. Come to the aid of all those that call on you this day. Especially we pray for Salva Sirka, Lillian Johannes, Jake Rodriguez, Bonnie Larson, Terry O'Hara, Lauren Magsum, Jolene Perkins, Joyce Papunas, Todd Ferguson, Caria and Ava Gumbos, Pastors Rick and Michelle Carlson, Becky Eisenwinter, Chuck LeBron, Sue Johnson, Allie and Aria Hammond, Mary Claire Swenson, Claire Halter and her family. Gracious God, grant these individuals healing, even if they cannot be cured. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, give vision to this congregation that we may discern your will. Help us to be visionary, continually thinking about what we can do better and what new ministries we can engage in. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, be with all those who are away from their family and loved ones. Be with all those who are in the midst of life transitions and new experiences. Guide their paths. And bless the various ministries, gifts, and talents of each person here, that they may use them in service towards you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All this and whatever else you see that we need, we offer up in our prayer to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We remember this day that the church is not a building. No. The church is people following in the way of Christ. The prayers that you offer for one another, the calls that you make, the Zoom meetings that you have with family, the texts that you send, the encouraging Facebook messages that you post speak to the way of Christ. You are the church. Thank you for what you do. And thank you for the many ways in which you support the ministries that we share. Your financial support makes it possible for us to minister in ways that we could never do individually. At this time, we receive our tithes and offerings.
Now receive God's blessing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus. Jesus.